Hey Dragon Slayers! Today's video is all about the effects of sweeteners and fermented foods on insulin, part one. Artificial sweeteners, thanks to countless non-nutritive sweeteners, it's possible to enjoy something sweet without spiking glucose and insulin. But be careful with how you buy your sweeteners if you plan on using them for baking or cooking. In general, if the sweetener comes in a powder, it can contain glucose heavy fillers such as maltodextrin, defeating the purpose of the sweetener, which is to not spike insulin. <clears throat> so here are a list of sweeteners and how they affect insulin. And I have provided this list down in the description below so that you can read it further for yourself. But we've got sucralose, which has no effect on insulin by itself. And the effect on insulin with carbs is increased. Aspartame has no effect on insulin by itself. And it's unclear but possibly has an increased effect when consumed with carbohydrates. Stevia has no known effect on insulin when taken by itself and no effect on insulin when taken with carbohydrates. This next one I've never heard of and I'm probably going to butcher it. It's acesulfame K. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. It is unclear the effect on insulin by itself, and it's unclear, but it possibly also increases um, insulin when consumed with carbs. Xylitol has a very small effect on insulin when consumed by itself, and a very small effect on insulin when consumed with carbs. Erythritol has no effect on insulin by itself and no effect on insulin with carbs. Other sugar alcohols have a variable effect on insulin by itself and a variable effect on insulin with carbs. Likely, it increases it. Monk fruit has no effect on insulin by itself and no effect on insulin when consumed with carbs. So let's take a look at the benefits of fermented foods. Modern conveniences are a blessing in most every way, but oddly, refrigeration may have yielded unintended consequences on how we digest and ultimately metabolize the foods that we eat. Before we could store foods at 39 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent them from going bad, many foods and drinks were deliberately or not fermented. Fermentation involves bacteria digesting sugars like fructose, lactose, glucose, etc. and producing acids giving them a slightly tart taste. Carbon dioxide, given a drink some bubbles or food some air pockets, and possibly alcohol, ranging from trace amounts to high amounts, depending on the nature and length of the fermentation. The chemical products are interesting, but it's what's lost and not gained during fermentation that may be particularly relevant in exploring the food's insulin sensitizing benefits. When bacteria are fermenting a food like a grain, they're not eating the small amounts of fat or protein present, but rather the starches. The bacteria eat glucose. Thus, by eating the starches in the fermenting food, the bacteria help us lower the amount of sugars we consume, thereby lowering the effects of the food on the blood glucose and insulin. So we have two pronounced insulin sensitizing benefits 
when we consume a fermented food. Number one, we consume less starch than the non-fermented version. And number two, we ingest bacteria, beneficial bacteria, that can act as probiotics in our intestines. So that's what I've got for you guys today. Don't forget to like and subscribe because it really helps the channel out. And remember guys, that together, you and I will slay the dreaded diabetes dragon.